All right. Um, that was quite a sobering conversation. And I want to thank my colleague, Matt Weil, because he, BPC is, is um, we are really fortunate to have such an election expert at our organization. And so this morning, we've heard from, um, we've heard some concerning things. And, but we've heard from a lot of people who care deeply about our democracy and at times put their lives on their line to preserve our democracy. And for me, I know it reminds me of what is great about America and what is the best of America. And in that spirit, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today, um, Admiral St <laughs> Stavridis. I know his name, but Jason Grumet was teasing me beforehand, so of course I said as soon as I got up here, I would mess up his name. Um, he's a wonderful person. So um, he is vice chair of global affairs at the Carlisle Group, and he's also chair of the board of trustees at the Rockefeller Foundation. He is a four-star officer in the US Navy, and he led the NATO Alliance in global operations from 2009 to 2013 as Supreme Allied Commander with responsibility for Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, Syria, counter piracy and cybersecurity. And so I am absolutely looking forward to hearing from him as I stated before and getting an opportunity to speak to the Admiral beforehand. I think we are in for quite a treat. And so with that, Let's please welcome Admiral Stavridis. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Very kind. So kind. Well, First, Kelly, thank you for a wonderful introduction. You pronounced my name perfectly. And um, what I want to do in a moment is talk about some of our challenges here. Uh, but I want to begin with just a, a point. When people hear that uh, biography and, you know, supreme allied commander, then they actually see me. <laughs> And they typically have two thoughts. One is, boy, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> and the other one is, you know, Stavridis, if you're really that cool, why were you not a Navy fighter pilot? Because I wasn't. I drove ships. And truth be told, and one of my classmates, Scott Jenkins, is here. He can validate this for you. Well, truth be told, I wanted desperately to be a Navy fighter pilot, but I had a traumatic experience at an airport when I was a young boy that made aviation difficult. <laughs> okay. I had hair then, too. Here's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it in 30 minutes so that we can get to a real convention event, which is talking and engaging and bringing a conversation alive. That's what conventions do. But what I would like to do in this keynote is like that sailor, kind of scan the horizon for a moment of our challenges. And I entitled this talk, The Dark Forest. It's an allusion to Dante's divine comedy, the first volume is, of course, the Inferno. And the first verse begins, in the midst of life, I found myself in a dark forest. The path to escape was not clear. Folks, we have found our way to that dark forest. And I think the question before us is, how do we find the path out of this forest? And we need to do it because our internal divisions are quite extraordinary and worrisome. And I put up here two logos, MSNBC and Fox News. And I'm talking to you wherever you are on that spectrum. If you get up in the morning 
watching Morning Joe and you wrap it up with Rachel Maddow at night, or you start on the white couch over at Fox and you finish up with Sean Hannity. Wherever you are on that spectrum, you ought to be concerned about the plummeting nature of our discourse with each other. That is the dark forest. And the real challenge is that the world is not going to wait while we figure it out. COVID, a withdrawal from Afghanistan, Vladimir Putin rattling the saber of nuclear weapons. This ought to worry us deeply, and we ought to think, how are we perceived abroad? Does Putin see us coherently standing together? I don't think he does. I think that was part of his miscalculation in invading Ukraine. How about this world, cyber and cybersecurity? It knows no borders, but it has become part of the battleground between us. We also have a significant strategic competitor in China. We must avoid stumbling into conflict with China. How are we perceived in Beijing? What does President Xi think about our internal divisions? Iran moving apace toward a nuclear weapon, and Kim Jong-un who already has them. There's a lot of challenge out there. The world is not waiting for us to solve these problems. In addition, there's chaos. Well, I've talked for a moment about nation states. This was the Pentagon on 9-11. Seems like ancient history. That small red circle was my office. I watched the airplane glimpsed it, I should say, as it struck the Pentagon. It brought home to me the fact, the irony of the fact, that wherever you are, you can think you are very safe. Here I was on a bright September morning, a newly selected one-star rear admiral in the Pentagon. I'm on the safest place in the world. I'm surrounded by concrete walls. I'm guarded by the strongest military on earth. I'm in the capital of the richest country on the planet. Was I safe that day? No. And then finally, as we look at challenges looming out there, like that dwindling iceberg, is the environment. The world will not wait while we figure this out. We are going to have to find ways to think through these problems and challenges. So if I've brought you this far, you're probably like me. You're concerned. And you're asking, well, what do you think, Admiral? What can we do to find a path out of this dark forest? What are the tools we need You know, that could range from pretty manual things to just a chainsaw to get us out of this. It's not that simple. But I want to take just a couple of moments and give you some practical thoughts about the tools we can use to help ourselves in this moment. We should begin by understanding the world today is deeply more complex than our previous leaders have had to deal with. As this implies, it's moving at speed every moment. It's utterly transparent, and it is completely interconnected. It is a very dangerous landscape. So what should we do? We should start by taking stock of some good news as we wring our hands and worry about all these external challenges, about our internal divisions, it's good from time to time to step back and think about the advantages the United States of America enjoys. Look at our geography. 
We're guarded left and right by vast oceans. We have benign neighbors north and south. We have the most powerful agrarian complex in the world, arable land, fresh water. We have boundless energy, oil and gas. We're building renewables. Upper left, we have a powerful and capable military. And bottom right, we have innovation. We have Silicon Valley, Route 128, all of that accrues to our advantage as we face these challenges. And I want to make a particular point. Immigration helps us. Do we need to control our borders? Yes. But immigration is an engine for this country. And I'll give you one quick practical example. For 10 years, as a vice admiral and admiral, I visited well over 100 countries. In every country, I would pay a courtesy call on the U.S. ambassador, who was representing the interests of our country. I saw two things that were identical at every U.S. embassy. Number one, guarded by Marines. That's a good thing. <laughs> Number two, and here's my point. Every U.S. Embassy in every city has lines around the block, in some cases, of people who want to come here. Think about that. Go to the Chinese Embassy, the Iranian Embassy, the Russian Embassy. 500,000 Russians just left Russia to avoid an unjust war and a conscription. We have lines around the block of people who want to come and be part of us. That's an extraordinary advantage. We ought to leverage that. We ought to think about it. We ought to celebrate it. That is part of how we find our way out. We should also look to history and look at our great leaders and think about their skills. Think about FDR, elected to the presidency four times, struck down by polio in his late 30s in the prime of life. He had to rebuild himself. Enormous resilience. A master strategist. He created the term, we used it a moment ago, of the fireside chat. He captivated and comforted the nation in the Great Depression in the Second World War, using the most primitive form of mass communication, the radio. And he also was a master of detail. Let me give you an example. If you were lucky enough to go to a dinner at the White House with FDR, occasionally after dinner, he would pull out a map of the United States and he'd give you a pencil. And it'd say, draw a line across the United States, anywhere you want, from San Francisco to Philadelphia, or San Diego, California to Bangor, Maine. Just draw a line. So you would dutifully draw this line. And FDR would then walk down that line. And he wouldn't tell you, you know, the state capital, the governor of the state. Any US president could do that, I think. <laughs> FDR would walk down that line and tell you the name of every county in the United States. There are 3,000 counties. He'd tell you the county seat and who was the head of the Democratic Party in that county seat. Pretty remarkable master of detail. That basket of attributes, hard to picture that in any one leader, but as voters, we ought to be looking for leaders who can compromise and bring those skills to the table. And since I talk about a Democrat, let me talk about two Republicans. If you put Reagan and Bush, and by the way, the Bush Gallery is right over here, named after war hero president George Bush. Put those two terms plus one term together. This was an era in which Politicians could reach across the aisle. They could solve problems. Famously, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House, 
Picture that one these days, pretty hard to imagine. We need to find leaders who are willing to fulfill those kind of roles. So we, we have to be part of the solution in who we select to go and represent us. What else can we do? We can listen better to each other. This is not Photoshop, by the way. This is an actual photograph from the 1930s. This officer is listening for incoming aircraft. It's quite innovative for its time. I put it here as metaphor. We need to listen to each other. This NBC person, turn on Fox and listen, and vice versa. Read and go to the websites of the other we must listen better. That's our job as Americans and voters. Doesn't mean we're always going to agree, but we need to understand the positions of the other. What else can we do? We can celebrate service. And people say to me all the time, and I appreciate it, and every veteran does, thank you for your service. But here's my point. There are so many ways to serve this country. Certainly our military. How about our diplomats, our CIA officers, our Peace Corps volunteers, our Department of Homeland Security, Border Patrol? How about our police, our firefighters, our nurses on the front lines of COVID for two years? My daughter's a nurse practitioner. The work she has done, extraordinary. How about our teachers? You know what? Wait for it. Starting salary of an American teacher in my home state, Florida, in the panhandle. Starting salary, $36,000 a year. You think she's serving the country? Boy, I do. Give it up for teachers. So here's my point. The more we celebrate it, the more we incentivize it, and we can do that through our tax system, through educational credits. There are many very practical ways we can do this. In my view, we don't need a mandatory national draft, but we need that idea of service to become inculcated in all that we are. Peace Corps, a good example from the 60s, the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps from the 1930s, FDR. These are remarkable programs. They can help us find a way out of this dark forest. What else can we do? Education. Kelly didn't mention this. When I finished 37 years in the military, I went to one of my life mentors, Bob Gates, and I said, Sir, what do you think I should do after the military? And he said, well, Stavridis, what kept you in the military for 37 years? Maybe that'll give you a clue. And I had to stop and think. No one had ever asked me that question. And I realized that there were a lot of things I liked about the military and the Navy. I liked wearing a uniform. I liked serving my country. I liked deploying on operational missions. I liked traveling the world. I liked all those things. But what I loved was mentoring young sailors, helping guide the trajectory of their lives. And I said that to Bob Gates. And he said, you ought to be an educator. And I thought, yeah. So I spent five years as dean here. So I know this space. I know education. I have taught in classrooms. I've been a dean. This can be part of the solution. But where I think we ought to put more attention these days is right there on our community college systems. This is an underweight resource. These are three of the largest community colleges in the country. I know the one from Pennsylvania quite well because my father was the president of it after his career in the military. What community colleges can do at very low cost is take young Americans 
and give them an education that can be scaled to their interest, but within two years, they can come out functionally as a programmer, as a maintenance supervisor, as someone who has real skills that can be applied immediately, low cost, low drag, we're underutilizing this resource. It can be part of getting us out of this dark forest because it is also a path to addressing the kind of inequalities we see, not just financially, but educationally as well. So listening better, service, education, what else? Another aspect to education, somewhat different, is right here. Now you're looking at that graphic, that map of the world, and you're thinking, hmm, what are those? Shipping lanes? No. Airline routes? No. Fiber optic cables? No. There's too many. Only 300 cables carry the internet. That's the world according to Facebook. The brighter the white, the higher the concentration of Facebook users. Here's why I put it there, along with that cell phone, also known as a supercomputer that everybody in this room is carrying around. In today's world, everyone can access everything, and yet we do not educate, particularly the youngest among us, to understand what they are seeing. When you pick up that cell phone, that supercomputer, you can communicate point to point anywhere in the world. You can listen to any symphony ever recorded. You can watch any film ever made. You can access all the world's knowledge. But you can also swim in a river of pornography. These are powerful and dangerous devices. And do you know the average age at which we place one in the hand of a child in this country? It's 10 and a half years old. And typically, we do that with very little guidance, very little restraint, and very little education. All of that education needs to be part of how we find our way out of this dark forest. What else can we do? We can innovate. We can apply new technologies. They can be as small as post-its, as big as moonshots, as crazy as the idea of airplanes on a ship. Who thought of that? A hundred years ago, exactly. Innovation can help us. And in particular, the innovations that we're seeing in our world today can help us address the environment. It can be an equalizer in the pursuit of the right kind of jobs that allow people the kind of self-dignity and self-worth that they need. Coupling the power of education to technology. Taking students out of traditional classrooms where warranted can be part of getting us through this. Healthcare. This is not only a place where technology can help, but where we must think coherently about the inequalities in the healthcare system. And I think our problem is that we tend to have this debate, as we do so many debates, as though it's an on and off switch. Either we're going to have a national health care system like Canada or Great Britain, or we're going to continue to have essentially figure it out yourself. Neither of those, in my view, are correct. We need to think of this problem as a rheostat, like the dimmer in your dining room. And we need to crank up the capability. We need to build on the Affordable Care Act and provide health care to the most vulnerable among us. That is part of how we escape. And we tie it to these new technologies, including telemedicine. All of that can be part of getting out of this dark forest. I mentioned this already, immigration reform. This is a big, hard, complicated problem. It begins with controlling our border. Every sovereign state must control its border. But we must add to that 
we must add to that thoughtful programs that can harness the power of immigrants who want to come here desperately and work and be among us. We need to provide a path for them. And let me make, a, I think, a very powerful point about this. Think about the vast majority of those who make it to our borders. How much courage and true grit and determination does it take to grab your four-year-old's hand, put your two-year-old on your back, and walk across six countries to get to our border? That's the Hunger Games, folks. Many of those people, I want them on the team. We got to figure out how to do that in a way that's fair to those who have gone through every legal process, goes back to controlling the borders. But this could be an enormous engine for us that can help us as we come through. Let me wrap it up with a couple final thoughts. All of this must be based on our values. And if you haven't stopped for a moment and thought about our values, it's worth doing, especially on this sacred ground where those who went before us thought about democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, gender equality, racial equality. Look, we have executed those values imperfectly, admittedly, but they are the right values. They come to us, many from the ancient Greeks, from the East, the philosophy of the Buddha. They drop through the Enlightenment. That's the young Voltaire up there. They come to us through our founding fathers. We see them in heroic leaders like Angela Merkel or Volodymyr Zelensky. Those values matter. And we need to communicate those values to ourselves, and to the world. And when I say this, people sometimes say, oh, Admiral, you're right, you know, it's a war of ideas. No, it's a marketplace of ideas. Our ideas can compete in that marketplace, but we need to strategically communicate those. That, too, is part of departing this dark forest. How fast do we need to go? Fast. But let me make a point using the physiognomy of the fastest thing on Earth. That's a cheetah. It can go from zero to 60 miles an hour in three seconds. And it's built for speed, right? Take a look at it. It's perfect. If you're building something for speed through evolution or creation, take your pick you would give it this body. That head is shaped like an ax. It cuts through the air, no drag. It's got powerful front legs, huge ribs to process all that oxygen, big back legs. Whoops, wait a minute. Take a look at that thing. Fastest thing on Earth. Why does it have a huge tail? Look at the size of the tail compared to the legs. I mean, why doesn't a cheetah have no tail, no drag, or maybe like a little decorative bunny tail back there? <laughs> why? Well, the engineers in the crowd will know that the cheetah, when it accelerates and then tries to turn, if it didn't have that big tail to balance it by going in the other direction, it would just go tumbling into the dark forest. So the point is, yes, we need to go fast, but we must keep the system in balance. OK, I'm Greek-American, Stavridis, so I'm required to have a Greek myth in every presentation. <laughs> There's Sisyphus. We must be resilient. Our leaders must be resilient. And 
the boulder rolls down. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're the most powerful person on earth, the President of the United States, the boulder will roll down. It rolled down on George Bush, 9-11. It rolled down on Barack Obama, the Great Recession. It rolled down on Donald Trump, two impeachments. It is rolling down on Joe Biden inflation spiking, a war in Ukraine, the boulder rolls down. The measure of anybody is not whether the boulder never crushes you. The measure is do you get up, put your shoulder behind it, and continue. That is what we need. Last picture, last image. This is a photograph taken a few years ago of migrants. This particular group is standing on the edge of the Red Sea, and they're prosaically, in this picture, raising their cell phones, trying to get a better cell signal. But metaphorically, what is happening in this picture? This is a picture of hope. They are hoping to get a better cell signal, but they're hoping to get to the next step of their journey. They're reaching for the light. It's a picture of hope. One of my great mentors, in addition to Bob Gates, was General Colin Powell. And I'd encourage you to Google General Powell's 13 rules, the 13 rules of General Powell, Colin Powell, that helped him and immigrant here in the United States, son of immigrants in New York City, that helped General Powell. Of those 13 rules, four of them deal with hope and optimism. It will look better in the morning. Hope is a force multiplier. It can be done. Read those 13 rules, picture of hope. So very last thought, and if you remember nothing else from our time together here at the Unconvention. If you remember nothing else from our talk, remember this quote. I'm going to quote Napoleon. I love to quote Napoleon for possibly obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> yeah, life is hard and short people have to stick together. Uh, <laughs> Napoleon who knew a great deal about leadership. Napoleon said, a leader is a dealer in hope. A leader is a dealer in hope. Not in fear, not in chaos, not in anger. Those are the kind of leaders we need. Be that kind of leader yourself, wherever you are, to whomever you are speaking. Be optimistic about this extraordinary country. Thank you very much. Pleasure being with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you so much, Admiral. And you mentioned your uniform. My husband is retired Air Force, but my favorite uniform is the Navy officer <laughs> uniform. Um, so just a couple of reminders, everyone, as we listened to what the Admiral had to say to us. He talked about celebrating service um, and incentivizing service. And he talked about mentoring and education and focusing on community college and uh, you know, not letting the boulder crush you. He talked about hope, but he also talked about we all should listen better. And so as you get ready to go down and have lunch, we encourage you to talk to each other and listen to each other. This is that opportunity for you to get to know each other. And so lunch is downstairs. We ask that you come back at 1.30 where we will start our next lightning round. Um, and a reminder to the students to please, let me see, you the de student delegates are to eat in the cafe on the first floor. 
And we also invite you, if you have time, to take part in some of the exhibits, the Civil War exhibit and the suffrage exhibit. Um, and we just ask that you be patient, because I think the lunch lines might be long. Thanks, everyone.